25 years. That's how long we've known Ash Ketchum. We've seen him grow and evolve. We've seen him go from 10 years old to 10 years. I, I really didn't have a point there, but we got to give some love to the ones who got Ash to where he is today. And I'm of course talking about his rivals. Just to make things clear, this video is only going to showcase Ash's rivals, because most of Ash's friends had rivals of their own, but maybe that can be saved for another video. Okay, let's begin at the very beginning. With Gary Oak, the first and the best. I mean, that's pretty justified, right? This child is traveling with an entourage of cheerleaders, but more or less starts his journey the same time as Ash. Deciding to pick Squirtle as the starter, Gary Oak sets off. And it won't be until 12 episodes later where we learn that Gary, he's been busy, as he's already caught 45 Pokemon. And that just so happens to include a giant sized Krabby. Now doing the math, that means Gary has roughly caught 3 Pokemon an episode, making him an absolute legend. Really, the next few times that we see Gary aren't that important. But don't get the wrong idea, because he's definitely been catching Pokemon and earning... I'd like to say gym badges? And by that time, he's ready to battle Giovanni. Where all of a sudden, Gary whips out a Nidoking and an Arcanine, who could really still use a little training. He also owns a Dodua. Already time for the Indigo League. And by this point, Gary Oak has caught over 200 Pokemon. So there's no possible way. Oh yeah. I forgot. But after that, Gary kind of goes missing. Which I, I could see. But when returning from the Orange Islands, Ash is caught up to speed that Gary owns a Nidoqueen. Well, more importantly, he caught a brand new Eevee before setting off to Johto. Do 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 Pokemon Johto! Oh my god. Gary will show up every now and again. And Johto, it's something different. But hey, if you're writing this down, Gary's Eevee evolved, randomly, into an Umbreon. And when Ash finds this out, he tries to challenge Gary. But Gary, he kind of didn't give a shit. Now is when we fast forward to the Johto League. And here, Ash learns that Gary has some pretty hard hitters. But that's not going to stop the battle that you all know. And it seems Gary has chosen his strongest Pokemon. But more or less, it ends the same. Oh yeah, 269 episodes later, and Blastoise finally appears. But hey, he's probably camera shy. But ever since that battle, Gary Oak, he changed. He decided to wrap up his Pokemon journey and to follow in his grandfather's footsteps to become a professor. While Ash and him, they slowly became friends again. But with Ash now traveling in Hoenn, Gary spends his time working on Sedea Island. He's just chilling there researching fossils. Gary Oak even manages to revive an Aerodactyl. It's unknown if he actually caught the Aerodactyl, but his Doduo did evolve. But Gary doesn't stay there for that long. Eventually, he moves over to the Sinnoh region. And we don't really know it for a while, but Gary's working as Professor Rowan's assistant. And I'm guessing Professor Rowan is very lenient, because Gary Oak just takes a vacation back to the Kanto region, just to beat Ash in a battle. Actually, now that I think about it, Gary's also here to review his Electrovire, the newest and maybe strongest addition to his team. And you know now that we got Ash traveling in Senna, Gary will show up every now and again, just like he used to. It was even confirmed that Gary Oak actually showed up to the battle between Ash and Paul. But now that Ash has left Sinnoh, I guess, Gary quit. Because shortly after, he will leave Professor Rowan and Sinnoh completely, deciding to not limit himself to one region, conducting research all around the world. And within this time, Gary got himself into... A research project, reserved only for the strongest of trainers, aiming to find the mythical Pokemon, Mew. And when Ash, and us as the audience, are finally able to catch back up with Gary, 
he's in the middle of battling a Moltres. And with Go Bingo, he's inspired. But Gary, he just found himself a brand new rival. And just like a broken record, Gary Oak dominates the competition. But it's all different now. Gary Oak brings the competition along with him. And hold up, have I even mentioned Gary's new team? Because damn did he go all out. Just a quick editor's note, it will be such a shame if we never see Ash battle Gary with this team. But it doesn't end there, because after him and Go travel to Galar, they take on the Split Decision Ruins. Ooh. And Gary catches himself a Reggie Drago. Maybe, who knows, one day Gary might actually be the one to catch Mew. But I don't know. The only thing that I really do know is thinking back on it now, it's fitting. In the end, Gary and Ash both became Pokemon Masters. Now I hope you remember the name of this next rival, because it's our boy, Richie. From that very moment he was introduced, it was obvious that he's just a mirror image of Ash. But it doesn't even stop there, because this is the team that Richie is introduced with. Yeah, you see what I mean? See what I'm talking about? But the thing that makes him unique is that Richie gives nicknames to each one of his Pokemon. Now Richie first appeared right in the middle of the Indigo League. And of course, him and Ash became friends. And of course, they are forced to battle each other right after. But when the battle takes place, Ash is left with no other option and is forced to send in his Charizard, who at the time just didn't care. Meaning that Richie advanced to the top 8, and Ash didn't. But Richie lost right after, so all is well, I guess. But what ended up happening was after the league ended, Richie traveled to Johto, overall fascinated with the mysterious Pokemon found underwater, which turned out to be Lugia, one that Team Rocket was trying to kidnap, but you know what's more important? Zippo evolved into a Charmeleon. Yeah, that's right. After all of that though, Richie still made his cameos. He was there and Professor Oak got kidnapped, he time traveled, and he even got to ride aboard the SS Anne. Like these are some classic Ash Ketchum adventures here. And within this time, Richie added two new Pokemon to his team, Cruz the Pupitar and Rose the Tailo. But that was it, our boy Richie. <laughs> he practically disappeared. That's until in Pokemon Journeys, where he reappears for a brief second, watching the Lance vs. Diantha battle. And it appears to me that he hasn't given up being a trainer, still battling in every league he can find. Now this next rival, you may know, Paul, has to be the most interesting rival, because up to this point, everyone Ash has met has at least had some sort of respect for Pokemon training. And seeing how Paul treats his Pokemon like tools really set Ash Ketchum off. I mean, he gets introduced with a pretty good looking team. Paul's not an idiot. He's traveled the same regions as Ash, and honestly, he knows what he's doing. After a few battles with, you know, Ash and literally the champion of Sinnoh, Paul realizes that his Chimchar is just not strong enough and decides to release him. And when Ash offers the fire type a place on his team, Paul deems both of them pathetic, but more on that later. Having now released his Chimchar, Paul's Elekid evolved, added a Glide score, and he even caught himself a replacement fire type in Magmar. The weakest leader I ever fought, and this lightweight badge is just like you. He's also a menace. Paul eventually learns that Ash completed the Kanto Battle Frontier. Paul, he actually seems impressed for once, and later attempts to challenge Brandon to a battle. You guys remember Brandon, right? The, the Titan guy. And later on, Ash would get challenged to a full battle. And most of Paul's team is already fully evolved. So it really doesn't surprise me that Ash gets literally destroyed. But now that some time has passed, we've made it all the way to the Sinnoh League. And Paul, just like Ash, has to be at his strongest here. His team is ready. I mean, right out of the gate, Paul goes ahead and sweeps right through his first two rounds. Damn, double homicide. But Paul's next opponent, it was revealed to be Ash. They were both more than ready. This isn't just a Pokemon battle. This is a battle between ideals and beliefs. 
the right way or the wrong way. And not only did Paul lose the battle, but Paul lost to the Pokemon that he declared was useless. Now look, I'm no certified psychologist or anything, but losing to Ash, that greatly humbled Paul. He left the stadium that day, with a new outlook on Pokemon training and pretty much just life in general. Finally, being able to respect his Pokemon, that at least got him as far as he could. Paul just wasn't going to let that battle with Ash affect him. He still continued to train, to battle, and just to work as hard as he could. Eventually, he was offered a spot as a gym leader. Well, at least that's what Professor Oak said, so I'm, I'm like 90% sure. And in Pokemon Journeys, when Paul stops by for a visit, it's revealed that he's gotten even stronger, now walking around with champion level Pokemon on his team. And after all this time, all that training, all that hard work, Ash still beats him. Our next rival should probably lay off the Adderall, because it's Barry. Barry starts off exactly like you'd expect, hurrying to challenge a gym leader that just isn't there. Instead, he meets Ash. Barry is quick to be skeptical of Ash, and I guess provoke Ash to a battle because that's exactly what ends up happening. And Ash wins, but Barry's cool about it. Also, just taking a look at this kid's team, it's safe to assume that he's been a Pokemon trainer much longer than Dawn. And while Barry sticks around for a little while, he challenges Ash to another battle, and wins this time. To be fair, it was against Ash's Gibble he just caught a few minutes ago. And a few days later, Barry has finally got 8 badges, while Ash is still one away. This is also the same day that Barry meets Paul for the first time. Barry wants a battle, but Paul, naturally, really doesn't care. But comes time for the Sinnoh League, and our boy Barry is pumped. Or nervous? I... I really can't tell. But getting to that third round, and let's just say Barry's gonna finally get that battle with Paul he asked for. I'd like to say Barry is ready. I mean, he does have two new Pokemon on his team. But everyone watching this probably knows how this is gonna go. Barry took his loss pretty well though. Staying to watch Ash until the very end. Promising that one day they'll meet again and that he'll be even stronger than Ash. This promise kind of fell flat though. Not because Barry didn't get stronger or anything, I, I really have no goddamn clue. Because Barry doesn't show up again after that. But what I can assure, at least, is that he's still traveling through Sinnoh, still taking on that league every chance he gets. And watching Ash become the world champion just motivates him to get even stronger. So who's down to take a trip? Back to Unova. Cause that's where we're going. And Trip? Oh Trip, he's pretty interesting alright. The first episode he's introduced, it's like he's a new trainer. Because he is. He literally gets his Pokedex. And Ash, he goes ahead and challenges him. And being as experienced, you think this will go the way it does. But it doesn't. Trip's new Snivy wipes out Ash's 400 level Pikachu. I think it was because he's sick or something, I haven't, I haven't seen the episode in a while. Then Trip, you know, being that civilized human being that he is, calls Ash a redneck. And refers to Kanto like it's Texas or something. Yeah! And Trip, it's weird, it's not like he's a normal rival, it's like he doesn't even care about Ash. Trip only appears a handful of times, and it's only to battle him. It's not like the two ever get in any rousing debates about what it means to train Pokemon or basically an argument. But there's this one episode where Silent and Trip have a battle, and it's like in a tournament. Silent, this normal gym trainer, just goes ahead and wipes the floor with him. Which is crazy, because that's before Ash even could. Imagine that though, it's like if Brock just beat Paul out of nowhere. Nash was like, come on, man. And now with Trip's team tripped out, already being at the Unova League. And Ash and Trip already get paired together in the first round, meaning it's a one-on-one -on -one against Pikachu and Superior. Get it? Coming full circle from the beginning. And after an intense battle, combining his attacks, Pikachu is able to win. But it was after this battle that him and Ash, I guess you could say they became friends, respecting him, even though he's from Kanto. After the fastest loss in a league I've ever seen from a rival, Trip left and continued his journey, presumably just staying in Unova, since Trip has always had this goal of beating Older, and losing to him earlier in the Junior Cup has him realize that he's been too much of a city boy, city boy. But now that Iris has become the new champion of Unova, 
Trip put all of that behind him. When in Pokemon Journeys, the two are just chilling together, like bros. And it's when Iris battles Cynthia, if you really want to know. Next up on the menu, we've got Sawyer. Now Sawyer, he has to be one of my favorite rivals. He's chill, he's from Hoenn, that'll win me over. He starts off at Hoenn, long before X and Y begins. As the promising trainer he is, he picks Trico, most likely or not catches some Pokemon while he's in his home region, and quickly makes his way to Kalos. And while in Kalos, Sawyer would meet Ash. And let me remind you, Ash is still starting out in Kalos, you know? He's still, he's still getting over his Yanova days. And right away, Sawyer sees Ash's potential and realizes, damn, this guy's good. From here on out, Sawyer slowly started to adapt Ash's battle style. But over the series, he's going to get noticeably stronger. Just having his first gym battle, we really started to see Sawyer's team take shape after his Trico evolved during another battle with Ash. But he, he's still kind of lost. But now, some time has passed, and Sawyer has now got himself four badges. And soon enough, we get to meet back up with him and his Pokemon. Looking good there, Sawyer. Oh my god, he caught himself a Hone Edge and has now fully evolved his starter. And when his trusty Sceptile was put to the test, Sawyer got introduced to the Bond phenomenon in probably the most brutal way possible. Just like anyone would be, Sawyer was confused. But I think they're gonna have bigger issues. And after some more time has passed, Steven Stone, the champion of Hoenn, would eventually start to take notice in Sawyer due to his battle style and him probably being from the Hoenn region. And actually, this prompted Steven to give Sawyer a keystone with Sceptilite, and just in time too. And before our last battle, battle before, before the, the semifinals, semifinals it's Tierno versus Sawyer! This is Sawyer's first Pokemon League, and he's already made it to quarterfinals. Look at his team, as he's up against Tierno. Sawyer hasn't shown off his new Keystone yet, so you can already tell this is going to be an interesting battle. Wait, what? It's already over? I didn't even get to narrate. Oh, that was so fast. But whatever, he already made it to the semifinals, so it's time for Ash vs. Sawyer. And this is the strongest Sawyer's ever been. But arguably, so is Ash. All right, Ash win it! But when it comes down to Mega Sceptile vs. Ash Greninja, Sawyer was just simply outmatched here. On the outside, Sawyer accepted the fact that he lost and wished Ash the best. But on the inside, Sawyer was torn up that his Kalos journey ended in a loss. But just like Ash, that first loss didn't affect him. Sawyer never gave up. He still helped save the world. But ultimately, Steven would bring Sawyer along as his protege, studying Mega Evolution alongside him. It's a dream come true. This was roughly around the same time that Ash left Kalos, by the way. And though it's been a while since we've last seen Sawyer, you know he's still out there, taking on every battle and writing down every note. If he's still trying, He's had to have won the Kalos League by now. I mean, he did learn from the best. Really? Sawyer could be in any region, learning absolutely everything there is to know. And by the time of the Masters 8, Sawyer and the rest of the gang are still there to support Ash. Just like old times. Did you think I'd forget... Alon? See, Mega Evolution has always existed within the main Pokemon anime timeline. We really just had never seen it until Ash reached the Kalos region. And a rare amount of trainers out there specialize in Mega Evolution. Alon, he happens to be one of them. Alon started his journey being an assistant of Sycamore, and this is years before XY. But sometime after choosing his starter, Alon got to learn about Mega Evolution. And by the way they're talking about it, Mega Evolution seems to be a recent discovery in Pokemon history only happening to certain Pokemon during battle. That means each and every day, people are finding out their Pokemon are capable of Mega Evolution. And with many questions left unanswered, Alon, he would leave on his own journey, wanting to own a Megastone for himself one day. But our boy, Alon, he found nothing. Nothing except for Team Flare. 
where Lysander himself persuaded Alon with what he really wanted most, a keystone. Alon fell into the temptations, and in the present day of XY, he travels around Kalos, harnessing energy for Lysander, believing that what he's doing is for the greater good. It's really not. It's all routine. It's a normal day for Alon. That's until a younger trainer hears something in the distance. Her name is Marin, and she's going to investigate. Whoa. It's a mega evolution battle. Marin didn't even know Pokemon could mega evolve, but is finding it out firsthand. And after the battle, Marin introduces herself. She just started her journey, and already wants to mega evolve. But Alon, he usually pushes people away, preferably keeping people across the battlefield. And Marin, she's no exception. But after Alon helps Marin catch her first Pokemon, it seems to me that they're traveling together. Well, at least Marin likes to think so. And with Marin wanting a Megastone, Alon brings her to Hoenn, for some reason. But even being halfway across the globe, no one can escape Lysander, who's come with a warning. A warning of primal energy. And now teaming up with Steven Stone, Lysander tasks them to contain this glowing rock from a prophecy that has been and will be foretold in every universe. The eventual and catastrophic meeting of the two legends of the Hoenn region. But Alon and Steven, they were in spectator mode. Well, they were tasked to protect the giant rock after all. So Alon sent out his Charizard. And while defending off Kyogre, Groudon had an opportune shot. Charizard has been hit. Charizard is now on the verge of death. But Alon, he literally leaped from the helicopter, all in order to save his best friend's life. While Alon was trying to stay alive, Team Flare was there to swoop under the ocean and steal that giant rock, bringing it over to the Kalos region, ending the primal prophecy and convincing Alon at the same time that this is for their protection. The same lie he's been telling from the beginning. But Lysander, he wasn't done with Alon yet. Alon was now forced to fight against 10 trainers with mega evolved Pokemon, but all in a row. And this is under the condition that if he loses, he'll have to return his mega ring back to Lysander. But Alon and Charizard were forced to put everything on the line and into this battle, fighting stronger than they ever have before. Alon knew he could do it. Easily, he defeated all 10 trainers in a flash. One of them even being a Kalos Elite 4 member. But one victory led to one tragedy. Marin's chestpin had fallen into a coma, and this was from an experiment gone wrong on that giant rock. This devastated Marin, and actually enraged Alon, who swore to Marin that he would collect enough energy to save Chespi. This greatly worked in Lysander's favor, and Alon still travels around Kalos. This was until one day, when he noticed Ash and Greninja battle. That bond. It's something incredible. Wanting to figure out if this is even Mega Evolution or not, Alon saved Ash from Team Rocket, and the two of them actually had a battle. And bringing out Ash Greninja, Alon detected no Mega Energy, just a connection between a trainer and its Pokemon. Ash lost the battle, but Alon still wanted to learn more about that bond phenomenon, and their paths would cross again. And this is at some random Pokemon Center. But this is where Alon challenges Ash to another battle. And we actually get to see some of Alon's team for the first time. And with Ash almost winning this battle, he collapses from exhaustion. The bond phenomenon is still just too much for him to handle. And Alon is truly concerned. But Ash was fine. And here the talk that Ash had with Alon, it really motivated him. The next battle they will have is when he enters the Kalos League. And just within 7 episodes, and one movie, Armin Alon traveled around the entire Kalos region, collecting himself an impressive 8 badges. So you know when you sit down and watch these episodes, you can imagine that after each of them, Alon has got himself one more badge. We meet back up with Alon at the Kalos League, where we find out that him and Trevor are the first ones up to battle. And let me just say, uh, oh you, you got to be kidding me. How could a battle even be that fast? Well, apparently, Alon defeated Trevor's Mega Charizard. In the blink of an eye, I, I guess. Pretty much setting the tone of the Kalos League. Alon sweeps through all of his battles. 
and after Ash defeated Sawyer, you already know who's in the finals with him. It's during that fight, Alon and Ash go back and forth on Pokemon attacks. Ash is actually withstanding his ground against Alon, both of them putting everything into this battle, just like Alon has done before. But everything eventually comes down to Mega Charizard and Ash Greninja. Alon's Charizard is still just too strong. But really at the end of the day, Alon won the Kalos League. He was really thankful for Ash and everyone who got him here. Alon accepted his new champion status. And maybe his journey is finally complete. God damn, I spoke way too soon. Not even knowing what the hell happened to the stadium, Alon will bring Ash to find Marin. But they were both kidnapped. Now face to face with Lysander. Here Alon learns the truth. His boss is about to recreate the world by destroying the old one. Everyone we've met through Ash's journey, their lives are on the line. Alon is furious that he's been lied to. Lysander, he doesn't care. He literally just wants to destroy the world, using the mega energy that Alon has been collecting for him. Ash, oh he's also furious, and quickly breaks out of Lysander's trap with his bond phenomenon. But it's at this point, Lysander is pretty much grits. Literally less than a day after Ash and Alon had escaped, the entire Kalos region united together like fucking Avengers. It was cinematic beauty. Not for Lysander though, he, he's actually dead. But Alon was finally free. No more lies. And after Ash revealed to everybody that he was heading back home, Alon finally decided, Hey, why not? Marin, you can travel with me now. And the two of them now travel around the Kalos region. Still searching all over the place for those mega stones. Well, it did remain that way. Until Journeys where Alon had become one of the best trainers in the entire world. Now showing up in Galar, Alon is fighting as one of the Masters 8, alongside Ash. And just like before, Alon was up to battle first. And this certainly isn't a Trevor. Despite getting the show off as two new Pokemon, Alon was brutally defeated by Leon. This honestly felt like being slapped in the face. But, I mean, I guess they do call Leon the strongest trainer in the world. Really, if you want my guess, I feel like Alon will show up again one day. And I also have a feeling he'll have every Mega Stone that you could possibly find. Maybe he's ready to show him off. I don't know. I hope you brought your sunglasses because. <laughs> it's Gladion. For him, everything started a long time ago when an Ultra Wormhole was opened. That's a portal connecting to adjacent realms and faraway space-time, but all within the same universe. Yeah, I know, it gets confusing. This brought forth Nihiligo, the first Ultra Beast that the Aether Foundation had ever detected. Nihiligo had almost kidnapped Lily, well Gladion couldn't do anything except beg Faba to do something. But luckily enough, Savali did. But Gladion had started to suspect something was up. He'd found out Faba had been doing cruel experiments on Savali the entire time even devolving it back to type Null. Gladion soon broke in the Faba's lab and took the Pokemon for himself. Starting his journey. Gladion spent most of his early days underground in a cave training. He was too afraid that they'd be caught anywhere else. In these caves, Gladion grew stronger every day. And when Ash would eventually travel to Alola and meet Gladion, Ash really wanted a battle. A battle that Gladion will consider. And in the morning, Gladion actually wanted to battle, and Ash was more than excited. It seemed to me that Gladion was set to win this fight, that being until Team Rocket shows up, and does their usual thing. Now after Ash returns from his little field trip back to Kanto, he finds Nebi, and Nebi found Gladion. Here, Gladion beat Ash in their first official battle, and actually- wait hold up, the two of them are actually having a heartfelt conversation. Gladion tells Ash the story on why Lily's too afraid to touch Pokemon. And just like Lily, Gladion is also haunted by the memories of that day. Speaking of, Faba would eventually try and erase Lily's mind of that incident, believing it's for her best. This didn't sit right with anybody. Definitely not Gladion. Here, Savali actually came Savali again, and defeated Faba. Well, at least they thought. Faba spent the entire next episode trying to kidnap Nebi, and by the end, he actually succeeded, using Nebi to open another ultra wormhole. And this time, Lucimine isn't the one who's so lucky. 
This leaves Gladion more stressed out than ever before, and Lily without a mother, but together, they travel to Pony Island. And here at the Altar of the Sun, Nebi evolves into Sogaleo, and Gladion, Ash, and all of his classmates hitch a ride to the other side of the universe. Now in Ultra Deep Space, they find Lucimi, who's currently being absorbed by a Nihilego? I've seen everything, and this is what's throwing me off, but almost losing her, Gladion will distract Nihilego while Ash uses his Z-move. This ain't no ordinary Z-move either, by the way. Lucimine is safe. They're all safe. And after traveling back to Earth, Gladion is leaving on a journey immediately. His words, not mine. Really, the truth is, Gladion couldn't just sit back and relax after watching Ash and Pikachu use a Z-move like that. From this point on, Gladion will be taking on the island challenges, just like Ash. And the next time we meet Gladion, the Alola region is under attack. Under attack from the Blinding One. Now joining the Ultra Guardians, Gladion helps to save Alola from its worst fate imaginable. It appears to have absorbed that ultra rare Soul Galeo and entered the Ultra Wormhole. Wow, James, that was surprisingly accurate. And now Ash, Gladion, and everyone else? Yeah, now they're trying to save Pulp Boy's world. Because when they stopped Necrozma back in Alola, it just made things worse here. But don't worry, because for Ash, Things are looking hopeful. Hey guys, I got it! That's awesome! What should we do? No idea! Oh, did my script say hopeful? Because I meant hopeless. But Ash and Gladion are able to pull through. Together, they're able to save Popoy's world while resurrecting the Blinding One. Although not realizing it, that might have been a mistake for a much different time. Everything's back to normal, for now. While still on his journey, he'd run back in the lily. And Gladion and Lily get lost in Tapu Fini's mist, with no vision of their father. But that's a good thing, because that means he's not dead. He's just out there somewhere, among the ever-expanding world of Pokemon. I don't see the problem in that. Though eventually, Gladion completes the island challenges just like he set off to do. And right after, he found his father's missing Zoroark, surely adding him to the team. And perfect timing, because we're at the Alola League. Where things are really get interesting until Gladion's second match against his sister. Hey, there's a new one. And trying her hardest to win, Lily just isn't strong enough yet to beat her brother. And when it comes down to Gladion's next opponent, I think Lily was more of a challenge. But things get heated when he's up against Kiawe. Get it? Heated? Gladion's gotta take things seriously now. Kiawe's Turtonator almost wiped out Gladion's team, except for Savai, who easily defeated Turtonator. Now Gladion's in the finals. Of course, with Ash. We've seen this battle play out many times before. It's like it was Ash's destiny to win. Ash had beat Gladion and won. He became the first ever Alolan champion. Well, Gladion didn't. But did Gladion care? No, not really. He's still really thankful for Ash and all the stuff he's done for his family. And it really won't be long at all until Magirna reveals to all of them that Mawan is living somewhere in Galar. Oh, but uh, we're not supposed to know that yet, so. Saying goodbye to everybody and promising Ash a battle, Gladion and his family sail away. But after months, and months, and months, they're led to the Crown Tundra. Here they find a quaint little shack in the forest. Their father was here all along. The reason he's here is because somehow he ended up in Ultra Space. If it wasn't for that shiny Naya Lego, we probably would be seeing Moana in that mist. Yeah, that shiny Naya Lego I just mentioned, it dragged him to safety and into the Galar region. From that day forward, Mawan had lost his memory and was convinced that Naya Lego was his daughter. But stop worrying. Please. It's, it's really making me uncomfortable. Because by the end of the day, Mawan regained all of his memories of his life back in Alola. A family reunited. And Ash was there too. Because why not? Now they quickly take him back to Alola. Back home. And Gladian gets to reunite with all of his old friends. And of course he watches Ash become a Pokemon master. But honestly, I didn't want to say this for any rival. But I actually feel like Gladion's journey is complete. He accomplished everything he wanted to. But don't worry, he'll be in Alola anytime. Where he can now sit back and relax under that Alolan sun. Yo, what's up everybody? You made it to the outro. I just want to address a few things. I know some of you have been waiting a whole year for a new What If episode. And it really hurts me too because I had that whole thing mapped out. The entire season 2. But then here comes YouTube, switching all my videos to Made for Kids. What I was getting paid before, 
that was now cut in half. This basically meant that YouTube couldn't be my job anymore. But there's a whole community post going over that. I, d I don't want to bring down the mood. And a few people have come to me and said, Hey Logan, why don't you just enable that join feature on your channel? And that was because I didn't want people spending $5 a month on a person who just wasn't uploading and wasn't even there. And if I ever do enable that feature, it's going to be after a shit ton more videos have released, I'll tell you that. Now before What If Season 2, there is going to be one interesting video coming. And I want you guys to go show this video some love. Because it's, it's going to be interesting. And at the end there'll even be a What If Season 2 teaser. Ah ha ha ha. No, but honestly, thank you. If you're still here and waiting ever since that last episode, you really mean a lot to me. And I'm never going to stop creating these videos for you.